Dr. Naomi Wolf. I'm re-recording um, this essay. Uh, and here we go. A Walt Whitman poem for Christmas Day. Must we really stand up for the truth? My father, the departed and much missed poet, Dr. Leonard Wolf, believed that once you write something, it no longer belongs to you. It belongs, as he taught me and his many students, not to the author, but to the universe. He also believed that even if a writer had just one reader, that was enough. The right words for the right reader meant that an entire universe was created. He was a Blakeian, after all, and saw, quote, heaven in a wild flower. He made, lit oops, he made literary use of the Talmud's teaching that if you save even one life, you have saved a world. My father also distinguished between what he called the, quote, career of the writer and the, quote, life of the writer. Careers he held in little esteem. They came and went. The acclaim or the disdain of the world were meaningless to him. But were you truly living the life of the writer? That was the question about which he cared. His eyes sparkled when he asked it. And the life of a writer set a very high bar. The question meant... Were you, every day of your working life, doing your utmost to tell the truth as you knew it, to make the manifestation of it in prose? He loved saying that lovely word, prose, beautiful. Were you expressing what had to be expressed without narcissism, without laziness, without hiding, without false notes of pretentiousness? Had to be expressed, quote unquote, was a magical imperative, for he was also a Platonist. He believed that prose that felt true drew on metaphysical truth, that such works derived from somewhere perfect before they were hewn by poor mortals onto the fallible page. He quoted playwright Arthur Miller, who was supposed to have said to an admirer who was praising a work of his, you should have seen it before I wrote it. I am grateful for his teachings about our transcendental responsibilities. I was once at a writer's colony on a fellowship a writer's colony in Virginia. I was writing my second book. I was a very young, somewhat, somewhat scared woman. One of the visual artists there was also a tarot reader. She asked my permission to quote, read my cards. And thus she explained to assess my near future. I let her hard in such close quarters to say no. And I confessed as she was looking at the rather alarming cards in front of her that I was worried about the reception of my next book as the first one had been controversial. I was still so new at submitting to the public roar, angry or positive, and I was just getting used to, or rather was not yet used to, people yelling at me on large public stages. She gave me a stern look and somehow echoed my father, whom she had never met. It's none of your business what people say about you, she told me firmly, meaning our job is to do the work assigned to us by our soul's commitment and ignore what the world makes of it. She was right. I learned painfully, but now I truly don't care what, quote, people say about me. 2022 has been a year of terrible combat in my life and in the lives of those I honor. There is blood all over the floor. You know that I believe that we are in the midst of an all-out war on humanity. The war is aimed at religion, of course, and at love and family, but it is also aimed squarely at art poetry, theater, dance, music, and all the things we humans do that reflect that we are made in the image of God, that raise us up, up from the surf-like status of, quote, hackable animals, the gutter level where the global evildoers, the Hamans of our time, wish to reposition us. I mentioned my father's training in not caring what the world says because we are at the end of a year in which the people whom I most respect and my husband and I too have been called lunatics, murderers, spreaders of lethal, quote, misinformation, ignorant, quote, unhinged, quote, anti-science, terrorists, unworthy of medical care, hysterics, and threats to society. The people whom I most respect have seen their livelihoods vanish, their institutional affiliations disappear, their former colleagues turn their backs. These people stood strong to keep a little flame of civilization alive, to save a world in which we don't murder our elderly with drugs and force them to die alone, in which we don't encourage depressed teenagers to kill themselves as they do now in Canada, 
in which we don't deny people access to society based on their bodies or their medical choices, to save a world based on justice, mercy, and compassion. Most of these heroes, I would venture to say, stood firm because they believed in something greater than the always mistaken clamor of the world. When I was interviewing Dr. Jay Bhattacharya early in 2021, I asked him late in the discussion why he had the courage to put his reputation on the line, given the unpopularity at the time of his anti-lockdown views. He had just shared his conviction that millions of poor people would face starvation if, quote, lockdowns were not lifted. Many of them would be children. I pressed, probably annoyingly. Finally, he responded modestly and quietly that he was a Christian. I am not a Christian, though I really love Jesus and try to follow him as my rabbi, a subject for another essay when I can find the words. I don't even know what I mean by that yet. But to me, speaking very humbly and with no great knowledge of what, quote, being a Christian means, there can be no better definition of, quote, being a Christian than what Dr. Bhattacharya was describing in that context. That stance of his, that selfless commitment to stand up for the well-being of others is to me a perfect example of the grace of which humans are capable when they have a higher calling. Rabbi Hillel, Siddhartha Gautama, the Lord Buddha, the prophet Muhammad, all expressed various versions of this immortal truth. I am not a Christian, I guess, but I tear up every single time I hear the child in the little drummer boy say, I am a poor boy too. Why? Because this is true for all of us. We are all, but for the grace of God, the starving children for whom Dr. Bhattacharya and only a few others stood up in the face of every kind of hostility and opposition in 2020 to 2022. I am a poor boy too. Most forgot that obligation to the children in the years 2020 to 2022 in order to fit in with the always mistaken conventional wisdom, the current moment. May we all remember in 2023 that we are all supposed to speak up for the transcendental truth which exists no matter what the always mistaken world has to say about us. We are all supposed to save the lives of our brothers and sisters, not just a few designated quote heroes, but all of us. We don't actually get to sit that out. For my Christmas present to you, I offer a quote from Walt Whitman's Starting from Pominock, Part 5. Whitman, a poet taught now in high schools, was vilified in his own lifetime by the mass media of his day, by the important critics, and by the government spokespeople. He was called insane, filthy, and the 18th century equivalent of, quote, unhinged, poisonous, dangerous, profane, disgusting. His books were illegal to print in Britain and then were illegal to transport through the mails in the United States. He lost his comfortable job in government. His health failed. His publisher abandoned him. He sustained a stroke and was partly paralyzed. He was finally so broken in health and so very poor that his supporters overseas had to send around a begging letter to get him some charity. And yet, and yet, he kept telling his truth. Censored in two nations, he had a book being readied for publication on the day that he died. Ultimately, Walt, Whit Walt, Whit ultimately, Walt Whitman was not silenced because history shows us there really is no such thing as censorship because the truth always emerges at last. Quote, Dead poets, philosophers, philosophers, priests, martyrs, artists, inventors, governments long since, language shapers on other shores, nations once powerful, now reduced, withdrawn, or desolate. I dare not proceed till I respectfully credit what you have left, wafted hither. I have perused it, own it is admirable, moving a while among it. Think nothing can ever be greater, nothing can ever deserve more than it deserves, regarding it all intently a long while, then dismissing it. I stand in my place in my own day here, here lands, male and female. 
hear the airship and the airship of the world, hear the flame of materials, hear spirituality, the translatress, the openly avowed, the ever tending, the finale of visible forms, the satisfier after due long waiting, now advancing. Yes, here comes my mistress, the soul, end quote. Quote, hear the airship and the airship of the world, end quote. By that, Walt Whitman meant America. Merry Christmas to you. You, I, all of us are asked by the grace of our human incarnation and condition, my mistress, the soul, to stand up for it, for truth, to stand up too relatedly for the poor boy, for the poor girl, for humanity. And yes, we are asked to do this as the baby whom we celebrate today showed us as a man, how at whatever cost to ourselves. This has been Dr. Naomi Wolf. The podcast is outspoken. Please support us at dailycloud.io. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah.